Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Adrian Bowyer, and I'm the person who created the RepRap project, which is what I shall be talking about today. Um, manufacturing for the masses. Uh, this is a way, a possible way, where we can move the whole idea of making goods from centralized production to distributed production, ultimately to individual production. And it's the way in which we might progress from where the world is today to how that might happen uh, that is the subject of my talk. Um, before I start, though, I'd just like to thank Eric and several other people in the audience, all of whom have been very helpful. Eric has set up his machines over there. Um, my little machine is here. You'll notice that they're different. We'll come to that a bit later on. Um, and uh, so thank you very much to them. And also thank you for the organizers for inviting me and for paying to put me on an airplane, which was very kind of them. OK. Um, many of you know what the machine is, but just for the, some of you who don't, RepRap is a 3D printer. It's a machine that makes three-dimensional objects in plastic from description on the computer completely automatically um, in plastic. Um, but the key thing about RepRap is that it's a replicating 3D printer. It's been designed so that it can print its own parts. Not all of its own parts, as we shall see in a moment, but a significant quantity of its own parts. Um, that's a picture of the machine on the screen there. Uh, that's the machine, in fact, a very similar machine to the one that you can see on the front bench there. Um, and this little part here is that part that's on the screen over there. And that part of the machine is actually this bit of the machine down here. Um, and so everything you can see on that picture that's this sort of silvery, whitey color was printed in a machine like that one in order to make that one. So it copies itself, in part. A um, few facts about the machine. Uh, it can copy about half of its own parts. That is, if you don't count nuts and bolts. Uh, it's got lots of nuts and bolts in it. If you count nuts and bolts and then look at the pie chart, the entire machine is made from nothing but nuts and bolts. Um, so if you discount fastenings, uh, then it prints about half of its own parts. In fact, that's not really cheating because it would be perfectly straightforward if you wanted to, uh, to have the machine print a series of little cylinders, which you could use in the place of nuts and bolts and glue the parts together. That would work fine. It would just mean that you wouldn't be able to take the machine apart again, which from the point of view of maintenance is not such a clever idea. But in that way, it would actually be printing literally that half of its own parts. Uh, it was deliberately designed so that the bits that it can't make as very, are very easy to obtain from hardware shops or from online stores. Uh, for example, uh, these threaded rods here, they're M8 threaded rods, completely standard size. You can get those from a builder's merchant just down the road. Uh, these motors here, standard NEMA 17 stepper motors, they cost about 10 euros each. Um, so everything in the machine that it can't make for itself has been designed to be as easily available as possible. And if you want to put one together, the cost of all the materials you need to put the machine together is about 350 euros. Uh, the working volume, the size of the object, the biggest object it could produce, uh, is 200 by 200 by 140 millimeters. Now, that's effectively the region above this blue area here up to the height that the machine can build. It would take quite a while to make an object that big. One of the things about this technology is that the time it takes to make something is proportional to the volume of the object. And the volume of an object, as you all know, goes up as the cube of its linear dimensions. So if you double the size of something, it takes eight times longer to print. One of the disadvantages of this technology, but we'll come to that a little bit later on. It'll build objects in most thermoplastics. That's plastics that melt and then re-solidify. Um, but the two ones that we use most of all are ABS, which Eric has on that yellow reel over there. That's ABS, I think, Eric, is it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's one of the plastics we use, uh, which works quite well. But the very best plastic that we found to run in the machine is the plastic that this machine is made from. It's this stuff, which is polylactic acid. And I'll say a few more words about that later on. Um, it prints at a rate of about 19 milliliters per hour, which means that to copy all the parts of the machine that it can print for itself, uh, the machine takes about two and a half days, though that's getting faster all the time. And finally, and perhaps 
as important as all of those other facts put together is the fact that it's licensed under the GPL and it's distributed free, both as in freedom and as in beer, um, on the web for anyone to download. And the GPL, of course, means that anybody who makes improvements in the design also has to distribute those under the GPL, as you all know even better than I do, uh, which means that the design can evolve and those evolving steps are always going to be available uh, under the GPL. Uh, here's a little map. Um, when people start putting machines together, we invite them to put a pin on the Google map. Uh, this is by no means all of the people involved uh, in building these machines, but these are just the ones who could be bothered to put a pin on the map. Uh, but it gives you an idea of the distribution. Uh, unsurprisingly, Europe and North America have pretty dense populations, but they're starting to appear in South America, Africa, Eastern Asia, and of course there's another concentration in Australia and New Zealand. Um, that's a snapshot about two months ago, um, just to give you a rough idea of where everybody is. Um, the total number of people building machines, we don't know because it's on the web. Anyone can download it. I keep discovering people who built machines whom I've never heard of. Um, so we have no real way of estimating. But the best guess we've got is about 2,500 RepRap machines and RepRap derivatives. That's to say machines that people have designed based on the RepRap ideas, but uh, have either made or sold uh, that are not quite the same design as RepRap. What sort of things does it make? Um, well, one of the guys on the project, Zach Smith, set up a website called Thingiverse, uh, where people can upload designs for objects to be printed, and then anybody can download them. And uh, to make this slide, I just went to Thingiverse, clicked on the RepRap link, uh, and that pulls up everything that's been tagged with a RepRap tag. Uh, and selected six things at random. Um, and it's a pretty versatile device. So top left, we've got uh, the drain for a shower tray. Somebody cracked the drain in their shower tray, and they didn't want to go to the shop and buy one, so they just had their machine print one. Um, sticking with a the bathroom theme, uh, in the middle at the top, uh, there's, a, there's a stop for the shower door. Not the same guy, I don't think, but... Uh, that was printed in a RepRap machine with a little cork insert for where the glass just touches it um, to stop the door smashing against the wall. Uh, top right, we've got a series of little interlocking trays with drawers um, so that uh, you can build up a stack of uh, these things in order to put resistors and transistors, chips and so on in, um, or indeed any small components, or maybe a spice rack. Uh, bottom left, we've got a series of eccentrically and interestingly shaped containers that have been sprayed gold. Um, in the middle, at the bottom, we've got a Saris linkage. Oh, Eric's got one over there. Thank you, Eric. Uh, in the middle, at the bottom, we've got a Saris linkage. Um, the way the machine works, and I'll be running it after my talk, uh, the parts and components of the machine move around in Cartesian coordinates on these sliding rods. Um, those that are part of the machine have to be brought in. The person who designed this linkage is trying to eliminate those by making a parallel motion, which is almost entirely designed in the machine and built in the machine itself. Um, this is a parallel motion that doesn't require sliding rods. It just requires hinge joints, which are here, here, and here, and so on around the, the object. Um, so that is a far higher proportion of self-printed parts. And bottom right, we've got a little robot. Uh, uh, might be an educational toy, um, something of that nature. All the mechanical components that decide the geometry of the robot were printed out in a RepRap machine. And that's just a sample that I took. Uh, we'll see a few more things that the machine makes a little bit later on. Um, 